Dystopia alert. By 2020, 300 million surveillance cameras are to be installed in China alone. 30 billion IoT sensors are expected to collect data around the globe. Machines will not only have an accurate profile of almost every citizen, but also be able to predict our feelings and reactions through Emotion AI. But what does it mean to the state of democracy? Will models of mass surveillance set a precedent in authoritarian states? How will this affect our basic human rights? Will democracy survive the digital revolution? Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos, a todas. Good afternoon to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And what I really want to do right now is to uh, engage in some reflection about the situation because I think that today's world uh, incites and uh, entices us to start thinking about these things and questions as to whether democracy will survive the digital age or not. And this is really a topic. I believe that we are now facing a time of uh, great uh, social uh, disquiet. We're facing a world which is uh, marked and characterized by uncertainties. We've come through ages of uh, change and we've entered an age of uh, profound upheaval. We are still kind of in the interregnum phase between what we thought before and what we thought were certainties before and what we will think about things in the future. But on top of that, we are also facing changes of such an order of magnitude, magnitude that they really have an impact on our spatial time uh, perception. And I think digital will also be taking us uh, down that road. For example, it will have an impact right up to the uh, throughout the, the upcoming uh, century, and on top of it, change is taking place at an ever greater pace. And therefore, I'd say there's also a certain fear that is taking hold of society as a whole. So what we've called, uh, we've called that the tectonic shifts, tectonic shifts that are really of that order of magnitude because they affect uh, the technological revolution and great migration that is taking place on a daily basis. Obviously, we have always witnessed migration, but right now, we're actually witnessing mass migration. People are getting on the move. We have caravans, refugees, etc. And uh, the climate change is also drawing ever closer. And then we also have this revo technological revolution that has changed us, and that is changing us as we speak. And I believe that we called it uh, the hyperglobalization. We call it the hyperglobalization for a certain reason. I'll show this uh, interesting graph to you because hyperglobalization has created a very, very high level of concentration. We're talking about uh, democracy and digitalization, but actually, the digital t uh, technology is in the hands of these. Companies, uh, companies. We're talking about seven companies on the whole. Seven companies that have a market. Uh, capitalization, which is even superior to the GDP, per capita GDP in Brazil. Simply look at this graph. You can see GDP of Latin America there, and these seven digital companies, the most important, the seven largest companies, have uh, $5.2 trillion, and the uh, GDP of uh, Brazil is uh, $2.0 uh, trillion. Or, uh, GDP of Latin America is just barely above that, rises to 5.4 trillion. So this uh, era of digitization, is it really the era of the citizen? Sorry, I think we need to step back a bit and think about this. We're really facing concentration here. So what is really happening? We're having few companies and very few governments, for that matter, very, very few, are actually having access and really taking ownership of our information. Illegally, they're having access to our brains, to our preferences, our daily lives. And if I say illegally, of course we've given them a permit having uh, set, uh, set our signature to the terms and conditions, and then 
we just turn around and say accept. But what does that mean, to accept under those conditions? It simply means that I'm giving these companies, because those are these uh, companies that are collecting the information, or the governments, because they have the necessary capacity to process this, we're giving them access to our lives. I'm giving them access to my life, to my brain, I'm giving them access to my preferences and predilections. And what are they going to do with that? Well, to tell you the truth, the political system will use it for electoral processes, for example, elections. They will look at you as electors and they will say, well, the voter has right. I'll try to see what are the preferences of these electors. And I'll try to see how can I can align my electoral campaign with them. And then the companies see us as a consumer because, well, somebody says, well, I prefer a, a, a bottle of Coca-Cola or I need a, a, an umbrella when it's raining. So all of that's me. So who really is in charge? And that's really the question. These uh, companies and governments that are recording our information, our personal data, will continue to have an ever-increasing influence on us. So, as our colleague from Kenya said right now, what can I do as a uh, citizen? You're just dazed and bewildered. The situation is confusing. We have global a uh, global situation, which is very, very complex. The interaction is very, very complex for a simple, normal human being. It's very, very difficult to understand. I really look at uh, things that really are of concern to me, for example, getting a job, for example, or what does decarbonization mean? mean? And then we have this, these global issues that are about the common good, the public good, and we are losing sight of that. The interest of the majority are the interests of the citizenship, like, for example, uh, climate security, um, the environment, and also uh, the uh, um, and public goods, public institutions. Here in Germany, you have public goods. For example, you can go outside. There are parks. There's a police force that takes care of people. And uh, in other places, well, if you just don't go down to the street, go out into the street, there's no public good. You simply get shot. So I believe that uh, I, we need to uh, link up much more, because what happens right now? All of this in information is very, very intimate. I am face-to-face -face with my computer, with my cell phone, and what really is taking place is that we're losing the bigger picture. So we need to really link up more to build visions and uh, foment ideas together. So this is linked to uh, an increasing sense of disquiet and dissatisfaction in society. People are enraged, people are angry, and dissatisfaction is taking hold. In Latin America, believe that 60, people believe that 60% of the government or the institutions are either corrupt or don't uh, merit uh, to be supported, so there's a very, very low uh, tax moral, as they call it, a tax base, because people simply try to eschew paying taxes. So to tell you the truth, I think technology is changing everything from scratch. The technology is changing our lives and our way of thinking. In Latin America, uh, we're actually well positioned, uh, given if you look at this, uh, for example, when it comes to technological uh, adoption and uh, broadband technology, we're uh, roughly at a 70% uh, range here. That's not that bad. But the problem, so the problem is not uh, technological pre penetration in that sense. We do have internet. It's not of great quality. So it's still a 3.0 3 um, or 3G internet, not a 4, and much less a 5. But... Um, we all consume through uh, our mobile devices, but nothing of these devices is constructed or built in uh, Latin America. So it is built in China, so we have a patent that comes from the United States, it's built in China, and then we use it. So what we need to do is change, because people are starting to feel uncertainty. Also when it comes to the world of labor, in Latin America, I have to tell you that the labor world, if we see exactly, if we look at who will be affected by the digital revolution, then look that it will affect um, disproportionately those who have uh, a very basic education. Those who are in sectors of low productivity right now, um, they don't care really right now. They'd love to have a, a mobile device because they could uh, go to the bank with that or use it as a bank. But when it comes to artificial intelligence or anything else, nothing. 
For example, the, uh, the person who is in the marketplace and with the market stall or somebody who is uh, working out in the fields, they don't care. So we really have to see those and look at those who are most affected and the ways in which uh, companies and their organizations are try uh, changed and labor relations are also being changed. But there's also a very uh, sensitive aspect there. There are no slides anymore. These are really my final remarks here at this point. Something that is really complicated and uh, difficult to express. Future is, the future is being defined in our absence. <coughs> thinking about, we're just thinking about daily things, about the child we have to take care of, uh, dinners that has to be prepared. But the world as such is being defined and designed without our presence. And we need to change that. It is being defined without our say. And the only way that we can change that is by activating citizenship an organized citizenship has to come to the fore. A concerned and an enlightened citizenship needs, needs to take uh, control here. Of course, we look at all of these promises. And obviously, it is important for democracy to have technology because it provides access to information for the citizen and it can provide to open systems of open uh, governance. But the uh, um, the uh, Accord of Escazú that was also uh, negotiated in Latin America provides a guarantee for access to information, to justice, and uh, also for the activists, for example, who uh, were um, working to defend uh, the environment. All of that has really been a huge effort, but it was only able to be achieved with the help of an active citizenship. And if we do this, then we can work. But what happens to our region? Just like Kenya, we're caught in the middle between two juggernauts, between China and the United States. And the decision between Huawei and iPhone, well, personally, I'd say, the one that works better for me, I'll take that. So that's how people are thinking. People uh, suddenly are waking up and saying, well, what? Oh, Huawei is Chinese. But most people in Latin America really ignore this fact to date. So how can we achieve a situation where we have this, uh, this balance in terms of power worldwide, that it does not simply uh, become um, a continuation of privileges? that we build a bridge towards a, a, a culture of equality. And that can only happen through conversation and through the involvement of citizenship and through a focus on the common good, on the public good, and trying to provide benefits to uh, the majority. And the truth is that uh, digital technology does not uh, affect democracy, but multilateralism is affected. And they're actually two sides of the same coin. And inequality is also in there, in the mix. So this is a kind of triangle that you have. That is how you have to see the way in which the majority interests are inf inf affected, and that will also have an impact on minorities. It will have an impact on all of us who are very connected. So I believe that we are right now really at a juncture in a world that is uh, inundated with information which is irrelevant, really. So what will be the difference here? What will make a difference? And that is what humanity can bring to bear on the situation, which is clarity. Clarity is equates power. He who has clarity, those who have clarity know which way to take, and that will translate into real power. And therefore, I'd like to simply end by saying that uh, technology is uh, not neutral, never has been, and those who can achieve the right balance between opportunities are ourselves. Why? In order to ensure that technology and politics are not just the art of the possible, but also the art of making possible tomorrow what seems impossible today. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome Gillian York and her panelists on stage.
Thank you. I'm very excited to have this group of panelists up here uh, to discuss the differences that we're looking at in terms of the models in democratic countries and authoritarian ones. By 2020, ones. And 300 million surveillance cameras are to be installed in China alone. 30 billion IoT sensors are expected to collect data around the globe. Machines will not only have an accurate profile of almost every citizen, but also be able to predict our feelings and reactions through Emotion AI. But what does it mean to the state of democracy? Will models of mass surveillance set a precedent in authoritarian states? How will this affect our basic human rights? Will democracy survive the digital revolution? Thank you. Well, that provided a much better introduction than I was about to anyhow. Um, <laughs> so I'm very, <laughs> thank you. I'm very happy to turn this over to my panelists who are each going to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves and then welcome Q&A from the audience. Um, so we're going to start with Marina Weisband. Uh, Marina brings a diverse background to this panel, um, having served as the political director for the Pirate Party Germany and currently serving uh, as, a, as a project manager for Aula, a, project, uh, a democracy project for schools. She's also a radio columnist and sits on the scientific advisory board of AOK Nordost. And yes, that is right. And you've also written a book, of course, um, looking at <laughs> how new democratic forms um, are utilizing the internet. So. Marina, please go ahead. Thank you. This is a difficult position because it's such a dystopic intro and uh, such a big question. And when we talk about democratization at the beginning of a new age, which is the age of information as opposed to the industrial age, it's always difficult to figure out what the important things are. In the beginning of the 19th century, people used to talk about basically railroadization. And they were asking questions like, are trains going too fast? Is that healthy for the human body? Um, so when we talk about digitalization and we mean our phones or our computers, that is exactly what we're doing. And what I would rather be doing is to look at power structures and how these developments um, influence a uh, whole uh, sets of people, which is more difficult because we live in the present and it's difficult to analyze the present from the present. What I see is basically a tug of war. And on one side of it, ironically, two players find themselves, uh, which are private companies and authoritarian states. They are on one side because they both, for different reasons, have a big interest in centralized infrastructure and centralized data. On the other hand of this tug of war is a global civic society. And um, the civil society and democracy, as it's called here, basically has an interest in distributed data and distributed networks. So the main question boils down to who do the infrastructure and the platforms belong to? Because that is the question of who can surveil us who can access our data, who can monitor us. It's not a question for me if surveillance is dangerous for democracy. Yes, democracy is definitely in danger. It is always in danger. It is most in danger when we believe that it's a natural state, as many do in Germany. Um, under surveillance, it's not only the very abstract for many Germans, for many Europeans, it's a very abstract thought that someone could control you, that someone could influence you or your behavior, or that you could be put in jail for what you think. It's a sad reality for many other countries, but here we feel quite safe, to be honest, which is false. Surveillance not only changes the way we act, it changes the very way we think and see each other and perceive each other. The fact that we are being surveilled alone changes our behavior, no matter who is doing the surveilling. And I wouldn't 
put so much difference uh, between states, authoritarian states and private corporations, because in the end of the day, there's a lot of interchanging there. Uh, states do get the data. If, if there is a big collection of data, states do get it through legal measures or through illegal measures. So we need to fight for possessing the very infrastructure, to collectively own it, to build redundant networks and to use them. And the second thing we have to do is to get rid of this feeling of helplessness that we have as a society and that always comes up on these panels, uh, like, we don't know what to do, it's also big, and it's bigger than me, yes, but it's not bigger than us. Um, what, where I see the future, and I do see very good developments for democracy, is in the ways technology enables us and empowers us to have a voice. We are better educated and better informed than every generation before us. We have more power and thus we have more responsibility. We have to use this responsibility. That means we have to better educate each other and we have to step into a serious discussion about our responsibilities. And there is a place I see for these discussions, for this empowerment of the citizen, and that is in the local community and in school. Because that's where you get everybody. The universities are a super select group. Um, market is a super select group. But everyone is in school, at least in Europe. And everyone lives in a place. The physical space is where we can meet people and where we can learn that if I change a thing, it will matter. I will see it every day and I will see this is what I changed. This is my power. The self-empowerment, first small, starting from students, which is what I do for a living. I um, basically give students the opportunity to shape their own school. I give them power so that they can learn that they have a responsibility. Uh, or in the community, not um, as we used to do in Ukraine when something about your fence was broken, you would call the president, but uh, coming together as a group and changing something. And I think in the future, national states will lose their importance. And what will raise an importance are interconnected communities. Because a city like Berlin honestly has more to do with London and Tokyo than it has with, uh, I don't know, some little German city. Um, we see young people discussing politics, discussing ethics on a global scale, through memes, through image boards. And this is a wonderful development. This is a development that has never been here before. So if we manage to come together in our little spaces where we can see the things we change, if we talk to our elders, to our kids, if we discuss not things like, oh, they are getting all our data. What is data anyway? It's, it's such a clumsy term. It, it's not they are getting our information, they are looking at us, they are surveilling us, and what can we do about it? And um, what can we change here, locally? What can we change about our behavior individually? And what do we have to change politically? And how can we do that? And I think GDPR showed a political possibility of regulation if enough people come together and try it. So um, basically, I'm all for, don't be so pessimistic, don't be dystopian, never think in dystopia and utopia, it doesn't help. Think of what can I do now, and who do I need to ask for a big change? That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. I think we're off to a good start with a little bit of optimism on this panel. Um, our second speaker is Marisa von Bulo. She is a professor for political science at the University of Brasilia and a fellow at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, among other things. Her research analyzes the impact of digitization on public life. Thank you so much. It is um, really a privilege to be part of this 
amazing panel. So we were presented with a million dollar question, right? Will democracy survive the digital revolution? Simple question. Well, um, if I really had to answer it, <laughs> I would risk saying uh, probably not. Uh, probably not in its current form. But democracy is changing uh, fast. The ways in which we debate about politics are changing fast. The ways in which we take decisions and the ways in which we think about representation are changing fast. So I think perhaps the key question is what kind of democracy will survive? What kind of democracy do we want to survive? Before I talk more about this, let me give you a bit of context where I'm coming from. We have a research group in Brazil that has been, for the past eight years or so, studying the impacts of um, new technologies on activism. We have been studying protests, and we have been studying elections in Chile, Brazil, and now in Argentina they have elections um, next uh, October. That is a bit unusual because usually social movement scholars study protests, election scholars study elections, and um, by doing both, however, we are able to see the double-sided nature of digital, digital activism, which a lot of people actually have referred to um, here. How, for instance, it uh, was able to empower students uh, fighting for public education in Chile, which in my opinion was a, a really good thing, and on the other hand, how it helped to uh, threaten the integrity of Brazilian elections in 2018, which was a, a, a really negative thing. So we're especially concerned about whether or not new, de new technologies have been able to fulfill their promise of leveling the playing field for uh, actors, of providing more equal opportunities, which is, of course, the great challenge of democracy in Latin America and elsewhere uh, in the world, as emphasized by the Costa Rican president this morning, as emphasized by Alicia Barcena uh, as well just now. So there is no single answer to these questions about democracy and digital uh, activism. Based on this research, based on where I'm coming from, I would argue that the problem is not um, technology per se, um, the problem is how we uh, use technology, of course, and um, especially problematic when we, we, the society, we underestimate its potential impacts and ignore the new challenges it um, presents. In the 10 minutes that I have, which are now probably eight or seven, anyway, let's move on, I will mention two key challenges that have come out of our research. The first one has to do with false news. Um, six months before the presidential elections of last year in Brazil, we had uh, a national survey and we added a question about false news, which was this question. Do you think you have been receiving false news about politics? And six months before the election was already very clear that this was going to be a huge problem. False news was already a very important phenomenon in Brazil and elsewhere. And to our surprise, two in three of the respondents of the service said, no, I don't think so. Um, I like to think of this as the winter is coming graph. So it was really um, a warning for us. No, um, not only face false news is going to be important, but people are not really aware of it uh, and have a hard time seeing the truth or understanding whether they're receiving the truth um, or not. And indeed, six months later, we had uh, an electoral process that, as in many other recent electoral processes, were fraught with disinformation and manipulation tactics. The lack of awareness about false news is scary in itself, but it's scarier because it comes with other things. It comes with lower levels of satisfaction with democracy and increased mistrust in democratic institutions. Again, by themselves, perhaps they're not so relevant or even negative. I mean, who can say they're really satisfied with democracy? But when they come together, I argue that we are facing a dangerous loop. 
a dangerous loop that lack of trust, trust makes great targets for disinformation, which in turn eventually lead to even lower levels of confidence in the political system and uh, consequently in democracy. I want to talk about a second challenge that also has come from our research and that I think is very relevant to put on, on the table, which is uh, a tendency for our societies to underestimate and misunderstand online political activities. And I will argue that it's um, false news I have just said. It's a really important problem, Aware lack of awareness about it. It's a really important problem, but it's not all about votes and manipulation. That is only part of the, of the story. It's only part of what's going on here. But a lot of people have focused on that or have argued that, well, this online activism is not real activism because people don't even get out of their sofas and they're just clicking, clicking away. And I think that has important political consequences, thinking of online activism in that way. So it's just not an academic debate about what is activism and how it has been changing, but it's also a, a much broader debate that I think involves the whole of society, because if we can't understand the new forms of online activism, we can't really understand the political turmoil we have been witness, witnessing in many places, among them in um, Brazil. Uh, I want to give an example of uh, this misunderstanding and underestimation of uh, online activism. This is a very simplified network of conversation on Twitter from, again, Brazil in 2016. That's two years and a half before the presidential election. That's in the context of the campaign to oust then-President Dilma Rousseff. And the nodes are Twitter accounts and the size of the nodes correspond to the uh, amount of times messages from these accounts were retweeted, so their ability to influence the, the debates. This um, network shows that two and a half years before the election of President Bolsonaro, the most relevant nodes were accounts that were already at that time campaigning openly for President uh, Bolsonaro. It was, however, seen as either the work of robots or as a bubble that would quickly burst. But in fact, what we argue is that um, President Bolsonaro's campaign, and we have other examples of this around the world, it's not uh, only, um, an only case, was extremely effective at mobilizing cyborg networks, by which I mean that it was extremely successful at mobilizing both automated resources and human resources. So agency is a key factor here. It, these networks brought together automation and an army of serial digital activists who were able to get together through digital media. And through digital media, they found an exciting way of voicing their, their views. So every Brazilian during the election had a, a relative that was sending non-stop messages, usually through WhatsApp to uh, everybody's phone in favor of Bolsonaro. And many of these relatives did not have a previous um, political uh, activity, were not really activists in, in the past, but through social media, through new digital technologies, they found a way of voicing their views. We can, we cannot ignore that uh, agency. And, but I think we haven't really given it the importance it, had, it has. So, to conclude, um, it is not only about disinformation and manipulation. These are, of course, very important and we have to be much more aware of them, as I argued in, in the beginning, but the political changes we're witnessing are also about agency and new forms of participation by new actors who were in the past in the sidelines of uh, politics. Through platforms that are not transparent, uh, such as WhatsApp, I just um, mentioned, and that in the Latin American context and elsewhere have been used to open the doors to more extreme ideas. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Marissa, and also perfect timing, as we've seen. <laughs> Next speaker, there we go. Our next speaker is Xiao Chang, who is an adjunct professor at UC Berkeley School of Information and the founder and editor-in-chief of China Digital Times, which is a bilingual news website. His current research focuses on state censorship and control of the internet, emerging political discourse, and public opinions on Chinese social media. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I was here the previous panels as an audience like all of you, and I heard the word China, 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 China quite a few times, right? Yeah. So here's the Chinese. <laughs> Don't call too early. I have not been back to China ever since 1989. I was born in China. I came to the United States to study physics as a graduate student. I went back to China almost 30 years ago. For what? 30 years ago, today. 30 years ago, today. We're talking about democracy. We're talking about democracy cannot survive. I want to talk to all of you about will democracy come to China? This. 30 years ago, this. 30 years ago, and this. My story is starting here, and I became a human rights activist ever since. I, this is 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I was in Geneva, United Nations Human Rights Commission, speaking on human rights, and next to me, the Chinese delegate called me a professional liar making lies about China. And after that conference, I wandered on um, Cologne Cathedral. And uh, there's a, a, a person who asked me to write something on the board. So I wrote a little poem that I'll tell you the relevance later. But this is what I really want to tell. Even the democracy being crushed by tanks and machine guns 30 years ago. But we had a ho new hope which is the internet will bring the freedom of information, freedom of speeches, will connect, connect to people, empower the voices. We all know that digital promise, the early stage, so does the Chinese people. Some of my friends went back to China, started an internet company, building the infrastructures with the hope, this time, we will open China. But the Chinese government knows that too and they will not let information get out of their control. And since then, I've been studying and following China's internet development, and the few things I know, there's China internet called Chinternet, and there is China. Between that is, of course, Great Firewall. This is Great Firewall. It has an official name, you can Google on it. It has an official website, but it didn't tell you what it really does, which is filtering, and monitoring the information traffic between China and the rest of the world. But also, within China, there is hundreds of thousands, you can see even millions, of the internet police or task people that are trying to regulate the internet. However, however, Chinese internet netizens are innovative and robust to use all kinds of ways to get around the internet and censorship. There is a struggle, contested space in Chinese internet since the last 20 years. And some of, this is from your magazine, Design, but it's publishing the research report of my group, documenting kind of words being censored on the Chinese internet. However, until 2013, I was still optimistic. I was quoted in this Washington Street article, Wall Street Journal article. We do think internet is opening to China after all. But the second episode come. President Xi Jinping stepped in power. We all know the rest, including the foreign companies. Apple left all the data centers in China. Let the Chinese company run it, including Facebook dying trying to go to the, access the Chinese market, went out of their way shameless, trying to appease the Chinese dictator, including Amazon, including Google. 
even they are trying to hold some of their principles, but in the, at the end of the day, they're still cannot wrestling with the Chinese authority power. This is the shadow of the Chinese in, uh, Great Firewall. What it is, is the traffic that the Chinese people using Chinese language to search Google simplified Chinese character, which approximately, approximately equal to the kind of pop, uh, uh, person, the, the numbers circumvent Great Firewall using VPN. So you can see since 2015, 2017, until now, Great Firewall is really powerful. It's not only Great Firewall is powerful, but they even developed a great cannon. I'm not going into the technical details about this because I haven't got to my real speech yet. <laughs> Is this what we're waiting for? We are seeing the technology boom in China. China is the largest internet market. You can give you all the numbers to say how powerful China's internet technology and Chinese companies are. I'll give you one after another, one after another, particularly on mobile pay, pay for example, it's dwarf United States, right? So the darker color is United States. Uh, I can keep on going and going on, and we all know today the largest company's internet is between two places, California and China. This is the third episode, unfortunately. We didn't anticipate this. The technology turn now is in favor of the ones who control the internet, who access to the data, who can manipulate the data, who can surveil the entire population. And that is dictator's dream technology. Right? Facial recognition, social credit system, you name it. And here we're talking about big data, we're talking about the surveillance cameras. We all know this story, so I'm not gonna I'm going to go very fast, but particularly, I want to highlight the place, Xinjiang. This is the police database that screenshot leaked on the Chinese internet, categorizing the people uh, uh, you know, in, their, in their social relations and the data they aggregate. And this is Xinjiang. This is the official propaganda of Xinjiang. This is the reality of Xinjiang. And this is the reality of Xinjiang. This is a protester outside of China. This is what I call the interoperated police system database. And I will not go into the details, but you can quickly read on screen what kind of data going into such system to monitoring the Chinese citizens and also establish dominance of the Communist Party's control. And uh, here is the company, list of Chinese companies who are getting the bit of those surveillance infrastructure and here is some uh, European researchers independently found out of the database that access to millions and millions of the Uyghurs and their bio data and their facial recognition data. And we're coming to the question, what's that got to do the world? Well, dictators never stop within domestic repression. They expand and they become imperial. This is the reality we're facing today, talking about international relations. Why did I tell you this? Because the Chinese companies are already everywhere. The one belt, one road, we're introducing Chinese digital infrastructure, those technologies were established in those countries. But I don't want to end as a simply a pessimistic ending. This is the traffic on my website, China Digital Times. You can see the traffic, even so small, but growing, growing, growing over the years until now, despite on the Chinese Great Firewall, it's going down and down. So there are people seeking for such information inside of China on a daily basis. I'll give you a number. On a daily basis, there's millions of Chinese netizens still using all kinds of VPN proxies to get around Great Firewall. And I searched the Chinese internet on some Chinese blogs in 2014. I saw this blog. Why? Because it posted my little poem, who I put on the Cologne Cathedral in front of the board, 
and being taken a picture by a Chinese military personnel as a terrorist, and it touched him. And many years later, he wrote a blog post. I found my poem again on the Chinese internet. The hope is still there. This is Mahatma Gandhi. When despair, remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants, and there are murderers, and for a time they can seem. Invincible, in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to have so many questions for you because I know that you had to skip through some of your slides quite quickly.、Um, and finally, I would like to welcome our last speaker.、Uh, Hito Steil is an artist and a professor of new media at the UDK Berlin. Her filmmaking and writing occupy a highly discursive position between the fields of art, philosophy, and politics, and explores late capitalism's so social, cultural, and financial imaginaries. Thank you.、Uh, Good afternoon. So Shao already explained how AI is being used by governments today, and I would like to focus on how AI predicts the future. And I would like to do so by giving you some examples, because you know, we heard that AI is able to predict the future, but how does it do it? So we. Made an experiment, and I will show you how this works because this is literally the future. This is a campfire, which is sort of future predicted by 0.04 seconds into the future using artificial intelligence, or more precisely, machine learning or neural networks. So this is literally a documentary image of the future using artificial intelligence, and at first glance you can already see two things. First of all, you don't really see a lot. That's the first takeaway, and the second is the fire starts getting out of control very, very quickly. So why is this, and how is this, and what's the matter with、uh, predicting this kind of future? And interestingly, I showed this to my daughter, who is 14, and she already knows, you know, that I have been training this kind of networks for a long time. And she told me, "Oh, mom, this is kind of."、Um, very understandable. AI is like fire, so、um, it's not a coincidence that AI is able to predict fire very well. And what she meant is that obviously, you need a specific type of footage to train、uh, a neural network to predict the future, and this kind of footage is very well suited to it. But I realized immediately that she may have made a much more important point because. I think all of you know, regardless of where you come from, that AI in mythology is sort of a representative for technology, right? Fire is the first symbol for technology. It's the technology that's being stolen by humans from the immortals and then used or abused and so on and so on. But fire, I mean, very literally, is a very important technology for humankind and probably also the most important one because fire. Is the thing that, by way of cooking, literally made human beings into what they are today by developing their brains and so on and so on. Fire is said to have been very important in developing skills like language, social communication.、Uh, it helped to survive in colder environments. It helped humans to migrate to figure out their ways to shape the environment and so on and so on. But 
So what is then the link between fire and AI? And certainly I'm not going to tell you that AI is going to be as important as fire in the future. Many people think so, and many people have made a career of pretending this to be the case, but I, I tell you literally we don't know, right? I mean AI is emerging right now, we have mm, only a vague idea of how bad it's going to get, let's put it like that. Um, so we don't know what AI is going to look like in the future. But I think there is one thing that seems to provide a clear parallel between fire and AI, because anthropologists, when they study uh, what fire mm, produced for humankind, they talk about something which they call time colonization, which means that the fire opened up the night for human activity. Before you couldn't use the night because it was dark and there wasn't too many things you could do, but then uh, with fire you could sit around the campfire, tell stories and so on and so on. So they call this time colonization and I think that specifically with um, big data-based prediction, also, you know, in terms of machine learning, there is another type of time colonization really happening because the prediction of the future is based on past training data, right? You can only use past data because the present, the, the future ones have not happened yet. So basically, the past is colonizing the future through this kind of prediction. And it's not only the past that's colonizing the future, but literally whoever owns the data from the past is colonizing the future. So the question is not really about what kind of future, but about who owns the future. And I think the question is clearly answered in this slide. I think it's a very candid idea to very openly tell everyone who owns the future. It seems that Mark Zuckerberg is the sole owner of the future. By, and in a, in a way, it's also true because you know the database that Facebook and other corporations own is colonizing the future by way of this kind of data-based future prediction. But this kind of machine learning-based prediction also, and this is um, engineers who are saying that, not me, very often turns into divination. A Google engineer called Ali Rahimi put it quite clearly in one of his recent presentations, uh, stating that machine learning has become alchemy. Why is that? Because even, you know, if prediction via artificial intelligence produces results, the, re the researchers and engineers don't really actually know why, right? So the, the relation between input and output is very unclear. This is also called the blacks black box problem. It's very well known, so at least some of these AI-based kinds of prediction are essentially divination. And especially in relation to fire, um, divination with fire has a pretty long history. This activity was called pyromancy in the Renaissance, and people were trying to predict the future from looking at the flames. And I think that something quite similar is also uh, going on in many cases today when we look at this kind of database divinations because we actually don't know how it works uh, and also whether it works. So let me show you how this kind of divination is actually produced. Um, you see? So this is, uh, this is the tool which I use to produce this kind of prediction. And I call this my political pyromancer because this is um, the tool that basically anyone can use to predict the future via artificial intelligence. And you, I have helpfully renamed um, the parameters which, which you can change in order to predict your own future. Um, and you can see that basically this machine is not just an input tool in which 
basically data are inputted, which give some kind of output, but the parameters are kind of very, very crucial in determining the outcome. So first of all, you have to, of course, ignite the fire in order to start the prediction. And if you uh, uncheck this box, the prediction starts to happen. And then, of course, according to the parameters, um, the fire will change quite a lot. Um, for example, if you hate this box, which I dubbed the hate box, uh, it will accelerate probably a lot. The interesting thing about this tool is also it's not real-time, right? <laughs> it's running in slow motion. So basically, you have to record the outcome to predict the future so that the predicted future already is in the past when you're able to see it. But <laughs> as you can see, as you can see, um, those factors uh, impact the outcome a lot. So this is a racial bias factor, which is labeled for German purpose. It's called the Aria Nachweis factor. If you crank this up, then I think it's like a Valhalla, you know, the fire is going to basically engulf everything. This here, the 0.14 factor is a very funny factor, or not funny, actually, it's a real existing factor which is used in the Austrian job security, uh, job, job center system. It predicts the chances for either males or females to find new employment after they were dismissed, and the chances of women are apparently 0.14 times worse. So this factor is being applied to calculations whether which the job center should fund their retraining, and so on and so on. So basically, I think I made the point, don't click the depression, everything will start, stop, it will just break down. And um, a lot of the buttons also do nothing. I think that's very common in AI, that there is a lot of buttons which seem very, very important, but in fact, they don't do anything whatsoever. Okay, so this is uh, how to predict the political future via pyromancy uh, or AI. And to make this, to, to cut my talk short, um, and to come to the role of culture, because I've been invited as an artist here. I think the traditional role of culture is to tell you this kind of stories, right? We are doing storytelling. We are doing fiction. We are doing mumbo-jumbo. We are doing a very good job at it. If you want mumbo-jumbo, just call me, you know? We, we got this covered. But you shouldn't really trust Mark Zuckerberg, you know, in trying to sell you mumbo-jumbo for facts. And I'm not only talking about Mark Zuckerberg, you have heard some very, very serious and real fact-based example of how this kind of mumbo-jumbo is not only being used to predict some sort of fictional future, but also to control and oppress and surveil populations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, where do we start? I mean, I think that first what I would like to just ask all of the panelists is, we heard from Izibara in the presentation before this that the future has been defined in our absence. And she also emphasized the role of clarity. I'm curious um, to hear from any of you, and I think you, know, you all have different things to say on this, um, what sort of clarity you would like to see brought to um, the issues that we're talking about today, to surveillance, to uh, AI, to censorship and control. Okay, so first of all, I would like to have the clarity that um, this is on us. We tell ourselves the story that there are powers out there who are mighty and who um, they do surveillance, they do data capitalism, and it's difficult and it's terrible. But there are very concrete political uh, actions that we can take. So the first clarity that I would like to establish in this room is, first of all, uh, learn about the concrete political um, steps that we can take, which I would love to talk about later. And second, perceive that you are now an educator 
whoever you are and whatever profession yours might be, in the new age, we are all educators and have a responsibility, um, which I think the other panelists used their responsibility wonderfully to teach us all, and I learned a lot, and we all need to be these teachers. No one else wants to, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, <laughs> This issue about the future being defined without us, well, of course, one reaction to a lot of the negative impacts of digital technology is turning our back on it. So a lot of people have canceled their accounts on this or that, or um, um, there is uh, this uh, political scientist who used to talk about exit and voice. So this would be the exit way. No. Uh, I don't think it's, I un totally understand it, I have done it myself, but I don't think it's the more productive way. Uh, and I think there are many, many examples of ways in which people have been incorporating um, digital technologies, and I, I mentioned very quickly the Chilean student movement, but we have many, many examples of people using either the platforms that are there, or building new platforms and building new places in which to debate in better ways with other kinds of rules about politics. And so I think voice instead of exit would be the clarity. Uh, we now see technology is power. And this particular surveillance big data analysis empowered, uh, AI empowered big data analysis is new kind of power who can access to all our personal behavior information and turn it into some other purpose. The political system will use for their own purpose to manipulate, for example, an uh, uh, election in democratic countries. But what about in authoritarian countries? They're being used for them to further rule their population and prolonging the dictatorship. So the question is, will democracy survive? Democracy will always survive. We survived the Second World War, right? In this country, Nazi threatened the democratic democracy around the world. But today, this country is a democracy. Democracy survived the Cold War, right? The Communist and the Soviet Union with nuclear power threatened the existence of the humankind. They're gone, at least for that point. And democracy will survive again this time facing the new challenge. But it is true that the answer relies on democratic countries, like in Europe, like in the United States, in Japan, Australia, and everywhere, Brazil, to defend your own de democracy facing those digital age challenges, to fix all the threats, but at the same time, collectively resisting the expansion of the Chinese digital totalitarianism. Surveillance capitalism fusion with a dictatorship, what I call the digital totalitarianism. But while we're doing that, just to remember, this is not a clash of civilization. Chinese people have the same desire for freedom and dream as everybody else. Xi Jinping has a slogan called China's Dream. His China dream is a nightmare of Chinese citizens and the rest of people who value freedom in the world. But as we remember 30 years ago, when there's a moment of freedom, you listen to real voice of Chinese people. We are the same. When we collectively, globally resisting the Chinese rising digital totalitarianism, it's actually supporting the struggle inside of China, eventually freedom will prevail. Thank you. So I made the case that the future has been colonized and it has been colonized by past data, but also by those who own those data. And I think that's a crucial point. These data monopolies have to be broken up. And this is not just an abstract claim. Let me give you an example which also connects to some of what my panelists have said. 
Um, let's, let's, try talk, let's talk about the data sets used to train artificial intelligences on neural networks to enable face recognition. So this is a very funny ep episode that two of my colleagues researched. There is a data set called MS Celebrity, which is Microsoft Celebrity Database, which <laughs> consists of 100,000 photos of so-called celebrities. My picture is in there as well. Mine too. Okay, well, <laughs> congratulations. So your picture was also used to train um, some uh, entities in a, in a university in China in order to enable the facial recognition of ethnic minorities in some parts of the country. So, uh, as you said in the beginning, um, abuse of power and surveillance by authoritarian governments is one thing, but they are also being assisted, of course, by big data corporations and the data that they have not only privatized, they have actively expropriated and stolen from people like me and you and probably also some other people in the room to enable surveillance and oppression. Absolutely. Um, I'm so glad that you mentioned that and that you're bringing it to corporations because I think we, I mean, Xiao, your presentation was so clear and I think it's quite clear to see the threat um, that's coming from China and Chinese corporations. But I think what we see here is, in, in many cases, democracies ceding power to corporations uh, in terms of how they regulate speech, in terms of surveillance. Um, and I'm curious um, for any of you again, but Marissa in particular, um, what what role do you think that these corporations play and what should we do um, in terms of the, you know, some of the issues that you've raised? I agree that uh, it, it's a, a key topic. Again, Alicia Barsna was talking about uh, Latin America and it's, I was just making the case about having voice, but of course the great obstacle to having voice is that we don't, are not really control the infrastructure and we not really control the, the production of, of content. So it is, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. I don't really have the answer to it. Again, um, the million dollar question. Um, I think, it, as was said um, this morning, it has to be a multilateral debate that includes states and civil society. I think civil society has a key role to play and southern civil society. There's, um, we have specific challenges, for instance, uh, it is very hard for us to know what was the impact of um, digital technologies on the last presidential elections. Not only do we not have access to the data, but even in some instances when we could have access to the data, we do not have the resources to buy those data sets and analyze them. So I, I think that the Global South needs to be included and the, the specific challenges we face, because at this point, it is hard to us even to answer this, it's not a simple question, but this basic question of what has been the impact on us because of, of the challenges of, in terms of resources that we face. And Shao, I would love to hear your thoughts as well, particularly in respect to the ways in which um, American companies or European companies are working with China. Well, this is a well-known story that the uh, American companies are, first of all, seeking China as a vast, cheap labor uh, place that without you know, labor unions, labor movement, and environmental protections, with you know, the, the government control all the lands and no private property, therefore, uh, when the authoritarian, authoritarian state sort of focused on its economic development, they can make big projects happening very soon and the big corporations will want to access that kind of environment under the market, right? So even the Chinese authoritarian regime itself didn't even you know, predict, but they sort of step into this globalization somehow. They leverage the the advantage of being an authoritarian state. Um, most of the wealth produced in China, and including those large companies, are not being distributed to those people, laborers, the migrant workers, that produce, producing almost all the goods around the world, selling in everywhere, that they still get a very low pay. But 
the state get rich, and the Chinese domestic so police uh, uh, cost, uh, so-called maintenance of stability, is already surpassed the military cost. That's what it takes a authoritarian state to keep control of its own population. And it's also a mistake to think that the Chinese corporation, any Chinese major strategic state-owned enterprises or so-called quote, quote, private enterprises such as Huawei, really private. The Chinese state companies, I'll give you one example, Tengxun, right? Everybody using WeChat, the entire population using WeChat. The internet police using the same screen sitting in the same physical space of the Tengxun employees in the same office space. There's no difference whatsoever. Now, this is what we're facing. And the foreign companies such as Google and, 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 and Facebook still, from, from money-making point of view, you know, understandable, want, need desperately access that market. So the power of one company, even they are so powerful, but they are no uh, match to the Chinese state backing to those Chinese tech giants. So if we don't come out with some kind of collective answer between governments and private companies to respond to this, the Chinese state companies, all of those so-called private companies of tech giants, will keep on expanding, expanding, taking advantage of the open societies, yeah, giving them all so much access to it. And then, even on the most cutting edge level of artificial intelligence, that Google, Amazon, and Facebook even starting to losing their competitive uh, 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 edge to the Chinese students. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chinese uh, companies. Right? Look at the uh, facial recognition technology, voice recognition technology, biometrics, all these artificial intelligence implementation on social control particularly. China is leading the world, and those technologies are coming out. So there is a overall strategic Re uh, sort of realigns and the consideration need to be there. It's not just which company wants to take advantage of making money. It's not about which country trying to make its own economic you know, trade and saying in this global context. We have to see there is two systems has different political values. And the different political values embodied in those political systems now both are empowered and threatened by the same technology. So that's the situation we're facing. It's not all the question, just don't just ask, is democracy going to survive? Can authoritarian regime really survive? I'm not quite sure of that. But right now, technology is going to the hand of the controllers. That is the challenge we're facing. Thank you. I want to, since we're talking, we've moved to facial recognition. Hito, I want to bring this back to you. Um, I'm sure you saw the news last week, I think last week or two weeks ago, that San Francisco has banned the use of facial recognition technology. And I'm curious, um, and of course you can bring it to other subjects as well, if that's the sort of democratic measure, the kind of extreme measure that we might need in the case of some of these technologies. I mean, definitely, yes. I think regulating a lot of these technologies will make a difference. Um, on the other hand, going back to the question of the panel, will democracy survive the digital revolution? I mean, maybe, who knows? That's possible. It may survive digitization, but the thing it will not survive is automation. And I think this is one thing that AI is producing more and more within societies. It's trying to automate governance. I mean, the social credit system in China is one example of automated governance. And I think this is absolutely the contrary by definition of what democracy is. Democracy is not only about making uh, decisions in common, it's about the process of discussing and arriving to the decision that actually is democracy. And if you take that away by automation, then it is not democracy anymore. And I think this is a temptation which is somehow present no, in the European debate. Oh my God, the others are so advanced in artificial intelligence, maybe we should do it as well, blah, 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 and so on. So the, 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 the 
temptation, you know, to go down the road of automation is present and it should be resisted because this is the absolute opposite of what democracy is about. Thank you. <laughs> I see you going, hmm, okay, well, I, that maybe brings me to my last question before we open up the floor for questions. Um, but you're welcome to comment on that as well, of course. Um, I wanted to come back because you had mentioned that you also had thoughts on the political steps that we should be taking. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I do half agree with you um, that we cannot, we can never optimize governance. We can never optimize human decision making. What we can, however, optimize is monotonous heavy work, which I hope that we do because not not a fan of that. Yeah. Um, I think it's time for us to stop with anxiety looking at the big corporations and, and think what are they going to do. But instead start building, start building now. Because one of the main problems is that the only big platforms on which we as a civil society connect and discuss democracy are profit driven. And we need to build other platforms that aren't. And it's not that difficult to do per se, it's, um, for instance, I've build a platform that is called Aula that connects young people and lets them have a democratic debate um, and empowers them. It's not per se difficult and it's publicly funded, so it's not profit driven. We can do publicly funded, uh, we can do um, community owned platforms. The question is how do we get people to use them? How do we make them the main infrastructure? Because I don't trust um, for-profit platforms. If I search on YouTube for Chemnitz, where there have been right-wing riots, after that I find a lot of right-wing extremist videos. That's because they get the most clicks. It's not because YouTube is evil, it's just because it's profit-driven, so that's the logic it functions in. How do we get people not to go to the place where all their friends are. That's why internet builds monopolies, right? Because we are where everyone is. We use what everyone uses. None of us use DuckDuckGo just because it's better for privacy than Google. Um, and the answer to that is a political one. It's not an individual one. The political um, thing we can do here is called interoperability. We can force Facebook and uh, whatever other big platforms there are, to have standardized protocols that allow them to speak to other platforms. And I don't have to be a member of Google to talk to people, uh, to talk to people on Facebook. I don't have to be a member of Facebook. And they can read my thoughts without being a member of my platform. So basically, everyone keeps their own data, and the different platforms can speak together through open protocols. But that is not something that the big corporations would do on their own terms. We need to force them, and we need to force them politically. And um, GDPR has shown that Europe has a somewhat power to force big corporations to do things they don't necessarily like. And imagine if it was not Europe, if Latin America joined, if, if other countries, continents joined. Um, it would be, we are the customers after all, we pay the money. So um, I believe we can change it through political action. We just need um, to uh, keep the democracy living to elect the people who will do that. Thank you. Uh, I see that it's time. <laughs> Thank you to all of the panelists, and we've still got time for questions. I see that it's time to do that. Do I have, um, is Geraldine here? Ah, there she is, excellent. <laughs> oh, technical difficulties. Danke. Ah, hallo. <laughs> Schönen guten Tag, Karl Carstens. Um, ich habe eine Frage. Um, und zwar, ich glaube, Frau Weisband. I would like to ask Mrs. Weisband about the new democratic forms. Excuse me if I pronounce it in a wrong time, but Mr. Chiang, Mr. Chiang said. 
that democracies, democracies will always find their ways to come back like after the Nazis. I think that is a good approach. Because that is good to say that democracies will always find their way, but in the digital revolution, I ask myself, what strategies do we have? We can't uh, expect the allies to come to march in again and save us again. We need to think about strategies about certain strategies to new democratic forms and how can democracy survive is an interesting approach to think about it because we should think about this. We have strategies against everything, against right populism, against wolves in Germany or whatever. Against everything we have a strate strategy but where do we develop strategies for new new democratic forms in this digital revolution that can survive in the digital revolution. There's a lively debate about uh, what strategies we can use in the digital age and most of all how can we use digital means to further democracies and um, people have been shouting for a very long while, I came out 10 years ago with this, uh, that we need um, digital means of participation in political process, that we need more direct democracy, not via net, but just direct democracy, that we need a more democratic European Union. Um, these are the things. It's, it's not, um, we don't change the paradigm of, of democracy. It's, it's not something entirely new. You can uh, build a lot on the very old principles of democracy. It's just that we, are, we keep electing parties who try to ignore the whole digital change. That's the problem. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bijan. I work for the Kofi Annan Foundation. Uh, before Kofi Annan passed away last year, he convened the Commission, the, digital, the Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age, tech companies, political leaders, civil society are part of it, trying to find answers on how to safeguard our elections in the digital age. Uh, the Commission is going to release its finding in January. I thought this is of interest to, to anyone in the room. Please come and see me if you want to learn more. My question is, there is a movement that says that uh, data should, owning your data should be considered a human right. Uh, I would like to bring that to the panel. What do you think? We're getting a lot of good questions <laughs> and hard ones. So I, I'm not even going to try to answer that. Um, however, um, of data privacy and access to data in the context of elections has been a, a huge issue in, in Latin America. We saw it in Brazil, we're seeing it, we're monitoring the, the elections, the upcoming elections in Argentina as well. And uh, as the case of, of false news that I mentioned, it also applies to data privacy. So people are really not uh, uh, aware of the extent to which this is a, a huge problem that affects elections. So specifically in Brazil, but I also think that in India and maybe in Kenya, maybe in, in Africa as well. Uh, but anyway, in cases where WhatsApp has been a, a really key um, um, app used for, for campaigning purposes, um, phone numbers have become, phone number databases have become um, key sources of uh, information. So it, it became uh, common and almost naturalized to receive uh, a message from a number, uh, often a foreign number, that um, from someone it was obviously not in your contact list, making propaganda, usually against some other candidate, not in favor of uh, a candidate. So we had huge problems of uh, illegal databases, um, telephone numbers, but also um, residence um, addresses and 
uh, age, gender being used um, again illegally in the context of the of the Brazilian elections, and quite frankly, the Brazilian authorities did not know how to react to this. Uh, it was a very tough learning process, and it was too little, too late. Um, they, we were not prepared. And when I say we, it's not only the state and public authorities, electoral authorities, but civil society also was not prepared to react to, to what happened in Brazil in terms of um, the illegal use of databases. And yes, I'm very much looking forward to your report. Please send it to me. I don't have a well thought uh, answer to your question, but I thank you for raising that, uh, which is whether we consider the owning of own data as human, a new set of human rights. Uh, but let's go back to where the human rights started, right? The, the fundamental principle of it, that treat human beings as autonomous uh, 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 and with dignity, meaning we treat each, uh, each other with equal, as long as you're a human being in the human family. Now, the surveillance technology and AI empowered is a new kind of power that under that kind of power lens, everybody, your behavior data, it's just a set of data. And that data can be manipulated, can be calculated, can be uh, uh, sort of uh, assorted uh, for some, someone else's interest. And that kind of, even without our acknowledge, without our recognition, without our permission, uh, even on a subconscious level, thinking of those technology can recognize your facial expression. And that kind of powerful technology does bring the potential abuses to human agency and our autonomy, it's threatening us. Therefore, to guard that space, we do have to consider expanding the concept of rights that we have to own this space, otherwise, the consequences is that we are losing our dignity and agency. I think we have, I think we have time for about one more question. Do we have one more? Yeah, ja, hier drüben, Florian Wagner, mein Name. Ich erlaube mir, auf Deutsch zu sprechen. Yes, ich I would like to answer in German. I have a concrete uh, question to uh, China. Over the last time, we saw an uh, increase of laws concerning data protection in China. And I would like to ask cyber security law and uh, others. And from our point of view, from Europe, um, it's um, a contradiction between, uh, for example, um, surveillance technology, we in Europe, we understand data protection always as a public law and private law thing. In Germany, it seems to be different. Data protection is there, mostly um, uh, transferred to some companies, uh, which then um, have data protection laws uh, when they work with others. Um, is this a contradiction? Or how does uh, uh, um, China um, um, see this uh, contradiction? When, when we all use the word China, 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 but China, there's many aspects of China. There are the individual citizens, there are different populations, there are um, the government, government has different sessions, yeah. uh, different political fractions has its own agenda. The, when you hear from Chinese officials that they, there's a new law of data protection, these are all true. Some of them are just trying to be you know, moving forward more like a modern society. Some of them are going through the motion that uh, uh, in order to only, but remember this, law in China right now in the dictatorship under a authoritarian regime means rule by law, doesn't mean rule of law. The Xi Jinping can revise the constitution just like that. And a few thousand delegates just raise their hand and say yes. That is kind of rule by law in China. And under that, control the population is the top one priority. That protect uh, privacy maybe at a certain degree to the society sometimes when they're necessary. But not coming to the state security and regime security. That's the worst regime security that Xi Jinping used. Okay. So to give you an example, right? Uh, I'm not gonna name it right now, but just say a Chinese antivirus company, security. Most of the Chinese PC has it. Then that antivirus software sitting on the most of the Chinese PC, 95% of the Chinese PC, 
can read on your computer everything. What software you install, what information stream in, what information out. On the back end, at the server space of that company, who are watching those data? Company, of course, and the state together. There's no data privacy at that level whatsoever. No matter how many data protection and privacy protection laws Chinese government pass for their citizens, they are not giving up any bit of control to their population. Thank you. Uh, oh, do you want, yeah, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Maybe, you know, I mean, we are focusing on China and rightfully so, but let me also add, there may be a, um, a right for people to own their own data, their own pictures and so on. But I would also like to claim the right for my own artwork not to be used as a decoration for the German foreign ministry to you know, recruit a delegation to board a plane to Beijing to try to sell German arms there. No? I mean, this is also a situation which has clearly happened. And I don't want my artwork to be used for this kind of purposes as well. Thank you. I would like to thank all of the panelists. I believe that we're out of time. Uh, thank you all for joining me today, for sharing your thoughts.